Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I very much appreciate my presence amongst you today, and uh, I enjoy the, par the presentations of each and everyone yesterday and today, not only because they were engaging and insightful, but most importantly because they were different, different from what I heard, from what I learned, and from what I experienced about women and gender representation in politics. And uh, today I'm going to present on sexual, economic, and state security violence in post-revolutionary Egypt. Um, I'm going to be focusing particularly on the year 2012 and early 2013 following the revolution in January 25, 2011. Uh, during this period, there were massive protests because the demands of the revolution were not met, and most importantly, there were massive and violent gang rapes in the Tahrir Square, the particular in the same square where people have revolted in the first place two years ago. Um, in, my, in my paper and in my presentation, I am arguing that there is a need to, an urgent need to, to shift from the discourse of blaming only perpetrators to our non elitist, low middle class perpetrators, and focusing more on the role of the state in perpetuating sexual violence with other forms of violence that cause and reproduce each other. This, uh, the above graffiti painting. This is known as the circle of hell, and it's a result of the activism of initiatives uh, of graffiti that seek through art to give Egyptian women a voice in public spaces. This painting shows sexual violence that occurred during and after the second anniversary of the 25th of Jan 2011 revolution. It seeks to raise awareness of the particular incidents in 2012 and 2013, where female protesters in Tahrir Square were brutally, uh, were brutally sexually assaulted with violent gang rapes as they were encircled by 200 to 300 men who fought, beat, assaulted, and stripped them. Sexual violence and harassment in Egypt do not just perpetuate due to victim blaming or self-censorship or only because we do not have good enough laws. Uh, I'm arguing today that sexual violence in Egypt finds its true causes in a misogyny that is not embedded in the nature, all the culture, or the religion of the Egyptian society. It's rather a feature of a system of exploitation. The system ensures its sustenance through judicial, economic, state security violence, but also through dividing society over issues of gender, culture, and religion. Um, it does not represent the culture or the virgin of Islam that we have in the Egyptian society, but it's yet reproduced by a patriarchal state. Such a culture allows sexual violence and harassment to continue to exist, but it also causes an international system but uh, certain discourse that says that women in, in Eastern societies are oppressed and need to be liberated and saved to be preserved, where women then become objects and are stripped this time of their identity and values in the name of liberty, autonomy, and agency. This argument aims to highlight to contemporary active feminists and civil society activists that misogyny in the Egyptian society is not just a social product or the result of a dominant culture but rather misogyny towards Egyptian women has developed in Egypt, especially after the revolution, due to circumstances that, have, that, that the Egyptians have inherited from the past regime. This approach is equally progressive to where the perpetrator has committed sexual assault and needs to be punished. The approach I am proposing instead tries and attempts to reveal the deeper causes and actions to understand how such sexual violence came about to exist in the Egyptian society. The accounts and testimonies given by women of their experience in post-revolutionary Egypt are outraging. The crimes and harassment became increasingly furious during the demonstrations of November 2012. During that period, women faced violent gang rapes, while most official and unofficial parties showed weak denunciation of the incidents, not to mention taking an action against it. Feminist NGOs, such as the Nazar for Institute for Feminist Studies, found throughout their research and direct contact with the victims that these cases of assault and rape all follow a similar pattern and style. The perpetrators target women who are either participating in political demonstrations, women who are passing by in squares or spheres where these demonstrations take place, as well as women from anti-sexual harassment initiatives who attempt to help those women when they are sexually assaulted. 
The incidents expanded more and became more vehement during the anniversary of the Egyptian revolution in 2013 during January and February of the year. Women were abducted at the exits of the October Bridge at the heart of Cairo. According to activists from civ several civil society, men usually create two lines and then begin snaking through the square in an attempt to find the victim as they chant the same words that the protesters are chanting. Their target was typically that of one or two women standing alone in the square. And once they find their victim, these men would create a U shape and trap them as they complete a circle around them. Others elaborated and outlined that the first circle surrounding the women began to beat and strip her. The second circle of men would claim that they want to help her. And the third circle of men are there to distract other people from the assault that is taking place. The Nasra Institute for Feminist Studies researchers assert that there is a clear division of labor among the attackers as one of them takes her phone, her watch, and her possessions. One takes her shoes off while another takes her trousers off. One of the women who faced such assault had her case documented by Al Nadim Center for Rehabilitation of Vi Victims of Violence. In, in Paul Amar's words, an associate professor in the Global and International Studies program in the University of California, Santa Barbara, he said, a primary articulator of an alternative feminism, Il Nadim Center led national and international campaigns to expose the state's efforts to assault the respectability of its most effective descendants through systematic sexual violence. It does not seek to modernize women or realize cultural and developmental projects. The NGOization of Arab movements has a cultural dimension, spreading values that favor dependency, lack of self-reliance, and new modes of consumption. In her life testimony documented by Al Nadim Center, a witness, Nahla Anani, stated that she was heading to one of the squares to participate in a mostly female demonstration, which also included sheikhs from Azhar Institution calling against the Muslim Brotherhood and President Mohammed Morsi while simultaneously supporting Al Azhar and the Mufti. One of the assault vi victims said, Similarly to what usually happens during predominantly female demonstrations, there were young men in the square. They volunteered to protect us by forming human shields around us. Once we reached the square, a crowd started to surround us. And I do not know if it was out of curiosity or other reasons relating to the events that took place afterwards. In an instant, the beatings and attacks commenced and the sheikhs who accompanied us to the square were nowhere to be seen. Another female participant in the same demonstration said, what happened was not merely sexual harassment. It was an intentional move to square women from the political life and from the Hrir Square. Scholars who joined us, uh, as our scholars who joined the march and said a few words about Islam's message of respect for women, we chanted in support of their words and then we continued to march towards the square. A group of people began to circle around us. Those circling around us said they were just trying to protect us. They were on our side. As we approached the square, more people began to join the group that encircled us, and so the violence began. They divided us, and a number of different circles began to group around the divided groups of protesters. They began to harass us. They beat up my friend, and there was an attempt to break her arm and some of her other body parts. They choked me probably trying to terminate my voice. They put their hands in my pockets and another girl they pulled and assaulted over and over horridly. S street harassment and sexual violence in Egypt has not only been localized in Tahrir Square, neither has it begun there. The same tactic to intimidate women was used by the previous regime in 2005 in front of the journalist syndicate when female activists were harassed and stripped by national security forces while the police watched. Among activists and journalists was one editor-in-chief of a weekly newspaper who said and described the assaults as an unforgivable mistake, a shame that the government will never erase. The same incidents occurred again during the transitional period following the revolution when the Supreme Council of Armed Forces was ruling. A study conducted in 2008 by the ECWR disproved the belief that there's a link between how women dress and sexual harassment in Egypt. It happens to all women, uh, regardless of class, regardless of religion, and regardless of the way they dress. 
even after these sexual assaults have taken place during protest. Their male counterparts saw the effects that the female protesters who shared the same goals of the revolution as burdensome. The main objective was to let the state succumb to their demands. Sexual violence was not one of the reasons or why the revolution has started. These women, although have played a huge part in the revolution, they were left unseen. They were not part of the history being made. And most importantly, these individuals have a free will and ability to make choices and write their own history. These choices are shaped by the system we have been given and can be altered thus, and can, as in this case, have outcomes that might have not been desired or intended. The same drive for misogyny is inherent in a system of governance that seeks to maintain the model of a neo-colonial state. As such, women who live in such a state need, on, need not only the punishment of the perpetrator, there is also a need for a judicial system that is not male-oriented and biased, for an economic system that is not conditioned by neoliberalist policies and the deficit of the dictator that they have to pay for the International Monetary Fund. Such economic policies had and continue to have its most adverse impact on the poor and especially the women of this segment of the population. Sexual violence and harassment became a source of power for those who were silenced and women either were confined to the domestic sphere or had to deal with the normalized misogyny every, every day as they had to go to work and sustain themselves. Even those who raised their voice were not heard by parliamentarians, judges, prosecutors, or state officials, as these two derived their power from misogyny and sexual violence against women. <sighs> the, theoretical, uh, the theoretical argument for my work uh, was inspired by uh, Professor Susan Mark's work, False Contingency. She's a professor of international law at the London School of Economics. And she, she basically argues that we need to look at the root causes of problems in order to treat them rather than just looking at the symptoms, trying to have more effective laws, but we need to look at more the root causes. And the term false contingency is a result of her examination of Robert Unger's false necessity. Necessity here implies a constraint pointing to the existence of external forces that mold, structure, or check. The constraint rises to the level of compulsion so that what is necessary is fixed and unavoidable and must simply be accommodated as it cannot be altered. It becomes fixed and unavoidable because of reasons that have to do with God, culture, nature, convention, or religion. This is how misogyny and sexual violence in Egyptian society have been portrayed in discourse and by uh, the mainstream discourse of the international world order and prominent feminists, where misogyny formulates part of the natural reality of this community, a reality from which women in this society need to be liberated and safe. Behind this false necessity stands contingency, which is con conceptualized by Marx as something that may or may not happen. This could be because of its independence on some prior event, the incidence or timing of which is indefinite. Or it could simply be because there is no scheme prescribing, proscribing, or otherwise influencing its occurrence. The emphasis is thrown on chance, accident, and all that is random, indeterminate, and up in the air. False contingency in the case of Egypt would be to look at crimes of sexual violence simply as crimes that happen in mere isolation, solely an individual responsibility of the perpetrator himself, the law middle class Egyptian man. Studying the deeper causes of crime, which is the aim of my work, does not necessarily mean denying the moral responsibility of the offender. E. H. Carr outlines in his book, What is History? That this does not only include facts, that history does not include only facts about individuals, yet these facts are not always about actions performed in mere isolation nor are they always about conscious motives or willed outcomes. It can be argued thus that misogyny and sexual violence in Egypt stem from a system that exploits and wants to exercise power. Since, as Philippe Riz, a documentary video maker, quotes in his work, all politics is a struggle for power. The ultimate kind of power is violence. The system has deliberately made women invisible and has given men the capacity to further exploit and abuse them. It is true that the laws that address sexual violence in the Egyptian penal code that Nama has mentioned are not implemented effectively, but they are also ambiguous. The reason for this is that they do not reflect or address the delineating social circumstances created and given by the current and previous system 
that Egyptian women aspire to revolt against and change. Instead, we have constitutional article that stipulates that all men and women are equal before the law. This myth of gender equality present in our constitution is only there to fill a necessary psychological space, a conclusion that was also reached by Jeremy McChrystal on colorblind laws in the United States. Sexual harassment has not been directly addressed in the penal code as Nama mentioned, but a lot of the words in the articles that tackle sexual violence are there only to make legitimate what the state does. The law cannot encompass or forecast all possible situations even if we reform it. And in this case, the law cannot protect us from state or judicial violence. Questions of the relationship between gender and law are important in the discussion. Questions of how the law defines male and female in society. Questions on what kind of liberations and limits are set by the law based on the sex of the subject are all questions that play a crucial role in the development of the relationship between gender and law and feminist legal theory. To Catherine McKinnon, law can reflect and enable political and social institutions of inequality. Women get unequal pay. They do disrespected work and they get sexually abused. Those inequalities precede the existence of the law. And as the law emerges in the liberal state that legitimates non-interference, the state can only correct the inequalities made during prior legal action. Even though that her critique holds true, feminists such as McKinnon assume that women's experiences and suffering is the same across all cultures, races, and classes. Even though McKinnon and others attempt to represent all women, they consequently erase the experiences and sufferings of women who are not similar to them unintentionally as they believe that there is one woman of legal feminism, that there is one unified woman's point of view of law. To give an example, let me consider the recent Muslim Brotherhood statement denouncing the United Nations Declaration for Women for violate, as they said, that it violates Sharia principles. This move shows how the state's need to exercise misogyny drives a particular vision of the religion of Islam and Sharia. This vision further seeks to abuse Egyptian women by calling on Egyptian women's organizations to commit to their religion and morals for their communities and the foundations of good social life and not to be deceived with misleading calls to decadent modernization and paths of subversive immorality. This state assumes that there is a set of determinate Sharia principles or that there is a determinate Islam. It causes women to have to make a choice between either their morals, their religion and values or their freedom and dignity. As demonstrated earlier in my work, it can be seen how female protesters and the Al-Azhar Islamic Institution both protested against the Muslim Brotherhood's vision of Islam, an institution that claims that it seeks to adhere and comply with Sharia principles and the religion of Islam. Economic, judicial, and sexual violence have all been counter-revolutionary forces used by the Egyptian state. This prevailing type of liberal state that encompasses mythical laws which do not reflect social reality, such as gender equality and social justice, and independence of judiciary is a system that seeks only to empower itself. For such a system had emphasized equality in terms of competition rather than care. It emphasizes a unity of the society that only exists in the head of people. The Egyptian state that the Muslim Brotherhood inherited from Mubarak sustains the same mode of governance. As B.S. Chimney depicts in his work Third World Approach of International Law, which governs international financial institution, he says that the mandates of international organizations have been broadly constructed to allow for interpretations by powerful states that are conducive to and practical to the needs of a global capitalist class. Throughout his work, he shows how barely any considerable change has taken place to affect the conditionalities for borrowing states, especially those who have gone through the Arab Spring and who have to now pay the dictator's debts. This tactic of continuous of borrowing is explained by Riz's work as a political economist, Harry Cleaver, whom he mentions and who says the borrowing was that the sovereign does to suppress further revolt. The IMF is even more determined now for Egypt to pay while in dire economic situation a dictator's debt. This is contradicted by the proposed debt relief package during the time when the United States sought help from Egypt in invading Iraq. To conclude, all of the above and much more happened and continue to happen under President Morsi's system. Time and space constraints has only allowed me to address a few of these issues. 
and examine only a few sources. Even though what needs to be done to protect women from sexual violence in Egypt remains hard to answer, yet contemporary feminists, lawyers, historians, and econ economists would have a more positive impact if they were aware of this mythical cycle of violence if they read history differently, which hides behind notions of autonomy, liberty, agency, equality, and justice. In Mark's words, I conclude, I have suggested that as scholars of law, we tend to give considerable attention to vindicating the contingency of history, but rather less attention to its necessary or determined aspect. As a result, a form of false contingency, as, have I, as I have called it, is left unchallenged according to which the injustices of the present order are made to appear as though they were random, accidental, and arbitrary. And if they are random, accidental, and arbitrary, then the process of changing them become every bit as remote as if they were faded. Sexual violence in Egypt is not an, an epidemic. It's not a phenomenon just to be tackled by effective laws or by reforming education. It needs to tackle the system, the system that maintains and exercises power through economic, state security, and sexual violence. In this case, not only sexual violence needs to be undone, but the violent system too by embracing an alternative feminism. Thank you. <laughs>